hopefully you find something interesting out of this. If not, uh, you can add another tool to your tool set. So. Before we get started, obviously disclaimers, right? Thoughts and opinions are my own, not of my employer or my educational institution. So a little bit about me, I am still a, or I like to call it a super duper senior at Eastern Michigan University. Um, I do uh, information assurance there, network security concentration. I don't even think that's a thing there anymore. I think it's called something else. Um, but I kind of grossly underestimated coming into the field uh, with a couple classes remaining and completing those. I thought I could just get them done whenever and a year later, I'm just now getting it taken care of. But with that being said, fall, I will get it done, so. Uh, I'm also a security engineer working in healthcare currently. Uh, I do DFIR and malware, so I'm in, in, on the side of DF things, I'm mostly memory forensics, um, triage uh, forensics, and then I do play with disk when we need to, so. Uh, on the malware side, we're actually doing, you know, some really cool things with Cuckoo, um, some detonation and some analysis stuff. Hopefully in the future, we're gonna get more into some reverse engineering. Um, and then other than that, I do consider myself a researcher and definitely an enthusiast. Actually, a group of my friends that are here, like we spend many nights on Google Hangouts just talking, uh, seeing what's going on with each other's projects. I'm always following the news, uh, things are happening, how we can, you know, take away those risks or what, what's available about anything of that nature. If you wish to contact me, you can hit me up on my Proton Mail account. Uh, it's just Blue Wing with a three at protonmail.ch. And then I am on Twitter, so for those of you that maybe recognize Baby Group, I'm Baby Group, so bluing on Twitter. I'm also on some security Slack groups, so I'm not sure um, if you, you just check if I'm in yours and I'll be in there. I'm on like seven different ones right now, so I kind of lose track of them. So today we're gonna kind of go over uh, what exactly Vagrant is, um, especially in this space, a lot of us are actually unfamiliar with Vagrant and that's okay. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, DFIR life and why this kind of inspired uh, my project here. And then we're gonna talk about Dreamcatcher, which is actually the uh, forensics box that I uh, built. So we'll go over a view of it. I'm actually gonna show you guys or, or walk through steps on how I built it. Because um, the main thing of this is it's not so much I want you to use my tool, I just think uh, Vagrant could have a lot of, or open up a lot of avenues for efficiency in uh, information security. Maybe not like throwing like huge stacks in prod, but like running isolated VMs just for forensic stuff or in that nature. So we'll talk about that and kind of, you know, how easy or the challenges there. And then we're gonna go actually over initialization and deployment. So the title is to quickly deploy forensics environments. So we're gonna actually show you how we can go from having no memory forensics environment or forensics environment on a machine to in about five, six minutes a fully configured uh, VM ready to go for your uh, incident responders. And then we're gonna obviously, with every project, there's lessons learned and future version info. I was, I was hoping to debut uh, the latest version today, um, but last night was a wild adventure. You guys wanna talk about that afterwards, but that didn't get done, so. Uh, I will be presenting this at Circle City, and that's where I'm really kind of pushing for the big release, the major update. So if you guys are gonna be attending there, feel free to stop by and see that. Um, and then we're gonna just go over some resources. So if you're like, hey, that sounds like a pretty cool idea, I wanna maybe do that myself, um, I'm gonna kinda direct you on where to go and what I used. So Vagrant is essentially a virtual management platform, command line virtual management platform. Oh, wow. Okay, can you guys see that okay? Or is it just like hugely distorted? Okay. Um, so it's made by a company called HashiCorp. Those of you that may be familiar with Packer, or have heard of Packer, it's the same company that does Vagrant. So it integrates with VirtualBox and VMware. The one thing I really liked about that, I'm not sure how many of you guys use VirtualBox before on like a Linux system, but VBox manages like the worst application to use in the time. I mean, it's terrible. Headless, headless environments with VBox manages just so many tiers, right? So Vagrant to me is like just this godsend because it makes it so easy to create, deploy, and manage. Um, and the great thing about it, right, it's, it's available for all platforms. So whether you're a Windows guy, if you're a Linux guy, if you're a Mac person, like you, you can use all of them on there. So for specifically for me, I am a Linux person, but at work, you know, it's a Windows, Windows only shop. So when I get there, instead of running, you know, let's say a virtual machine um, with the GUI and everything and just takes up resources, I can just spin up a Vagrant box in the platform and use that, or in the background and use that. Um, like I said, it actually is mostly used by developers at this point. Um, a lot of them use it for their app application testing or script testing. Um, and the, honestly, the, the community support behind Vagrant is one of the reasons why I really like it. It's a very good community. Um, I'm sure if those of you who have used open source projects, a community can really make or break a project to me. 
Um, and the community is so helpful, and even like you know, from the developer standpoint, like you're even seeing some security people in there too doing some things. So it's it's just awesome. Um, and I guess we'll talk about my vagrant use case. So like I said, I kind of alluded it to it a little bit before. I'm, I'm I work in a Windows only shop. Um, obviously, doing memory forensics and stuff. I use a lot of open source tools. I like to use them in a Linux environment. So that really created issues with me at first. Um, so what I was doing was just booting up a basic Ubuntu box in Vagrant and SSHing in, and then I was just installing my tools. I have an, uh, an auto-install script I, did, I have for like Volatility, Yara, SSD, Cuckoo, and I would just throw that sucker in there and every time. Then I got even lazier, right? Because I was like, not only do I have this like super awesome box I can quickly spin up and then drop my script on it to configure it, I was like, I don't even want to drop that script on it. Like, I just want it to be good to go when I boot it up. So that's how that kind of came in there, but that all kind of originated um, before that because I do do a little bit of Ruby programming, nothing crazy. Uh, I'm sure if you guys saw Kent's talk yesterday, some crazy stuff. Obviously, he's giving one on Saturday to a high check. He's a good buddy of mine, so he's actually the one that introduced me to the wonderful world of Vagrant. So I started using it for my really crappy Ruby scripts, and then I just had this idea, and I was like, hey, this is, this is really quick, and I can deploy things, and we can get rocking. And I was like, why don't I just do that then, right? So now that we talked a little bit about Vagrant, we got to discuss... Okay, well, why do you like that efficiency so much? Why, why do you like that so much? So we're going to talk about DFIR life, right? So we got the cute little meme here, and it's, oh, you think you're on PTO, that's funny. And it, honestly, it's true. And that's nothing against my job or your job if you're in incident response. That's, that's the life we chose, right? We chose to go into IR. So, and I don't mean like, oh, you can never take time off, but what I'm saying is if I'm sitting even up here, right, giving this talk right now, and then I get pinged, for a high priority event, I have to go and act, right? I, can't, I, I don't have the luxury to be like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow when I log in in the morning. You can't do that, so no matter where you're at, you have to be ready to go. So with that being said, a lot of instant responders have these ready kits, right, to go kits. Well, the problem with that is, I know personally, I always forget things, or I don't bring things with me, especially when I'm traveling. I have like this weird anxiety thing, so I'm like, I don't want all these devices in my bag. Like TSA's gonna be like, what the hell do you do, man? And I'm just gonna be like, I don't know, like I just, it's for my job, I'm sorry. And that's actually a stretch, because I honestly, I would leave it at home. I'd probably forget it. Now, there's certain things that are in those ready kits, right? So we're looking at maybe virtual environments you already have, such as sans SIF distro is a big one, or you know, if you're, you want security on it to monitor or relay some things on the fly, you might have those on, uh, external drives with you. So if you forget those and you're out somewhere and you get pinged for an event, how are you going to do your job? Well, you're going to have to reinstall SIFT and we all know, and this is like, you know, obviously not shots fired at SIFT, but that server is terrible. Like it's like a four gig uh, virtual file and I think it takes like over an hour to download even on a good connection. So you're going to wait for that and then you're going to have to, you know, spin up the virtual machine. And in that point, there's, there's an hour gap. There's about an hour and a half where you were pretty much rendered useless um, in the investigation or when the, in the event. Um, and that kind of brings me to the next point, and you know, nothing, nothing on SIFT, I love SANS, and, I, and that's where I started on with SIFT back in school. Um, but it's just so bloaty, right? Like, I'm, I use it specifically for forensics, so I, I guess you could kind of make an argument, but why would I need things like Aircrack NG on a forensics box? Or, you know, it's like there's just so many other tools that are like that that are on there, and I was just like, wow, okay, well, I don't really need that. And then another thing I always get all the time, well, I don't use virtual environments for my investigations because I run everything bare metal. I do it on my own machine. If you're from a shop that gives you a Mac Pro or a, you know, allows you to do Linux, and that's, your, that's great. Mine does. I don't have that luxury. I know a lot of people don't have that luxury. Um, and also, that doesn't fit in my investigation style. Even if I had a dedicated workstation for forensics work, I'm probably going to still do it in a virtual environment because I don't know about you guys, but during my investigations, I'm just outputting logs. It's a disaster. It's like when someone shows you their desktop and there's just like 50 icons on it, right? Those are my forensics environments. So at the end of it, honestly, what I like to do is I like to extract that data, right? I encrypt it, I extract it, I put it on the storage device for later if they need it, and then I just blow it away. Next investigation I get, it's a whole new environment. I don't have to worry about any residual anything. I know it's good. I know the integrity of my environment, which is a big thing in forensics too. So when people give me this bare metal uh, rebuttal, essentially, I find that these people aren't partitioning their drives correctly. They're not doing proper encryption techniques. So you, know, you can already point a flaw in their aspect, saying, well, you know, the integrity of your data is at risk because of your bare metal. You're using it as a personal device and a forensics device. You know, there's no separation, and you're not going out of your way to separate it. Um, so that's another thing. But my, my main thing is, what are you usually dealing with? And we all know uh, forensics has changed like, dr drastically, probably 
five, six years where it was so disk, 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 disk forensics, and then it went to memory, and now what we're actually seeing is a push towards live forensics, right, like triage forensics, so we don't even need to do memory sometimes. So you have to look at what you're dealing with. For me, uh, you know, we joke at my job, but I'm like the memory guy. So for me, I don't need an uh, autopsy sleuth kit or any of that stuff or even Wireshark on a device. I really just need my choice of uh, memory framework, which is volatility, and then maybe some Yara functionality if I you know, want to generate some rules or use some other rules. And then obviously the plugins, right, that come with volatility. And then SSD is something I like. Uh, for the fuzzy hashing, but we'll, we'll get into those things a little bit more in case those of you aren't familiar with any of those. Um, so at the end of the day, though, every DFIR person I've ever met has their, has their Swiss Army knife. They have their specific toolkit that they use, and that's fine, and that's how you should do things. You should tailor it to yourself. I like it when people kind of build their own things, and that's why I kind of built my own environment, because it's really tailored to my workflow and what I need it for. Does it work for everyone? Maybe not, but if there's a Maybe someone in here that does a lot of memory forensics at their shop, I would suggest giving it a try. Uh, it, it saved me a lot of headaches, but I'm not saying it's the end all be all. I'm sure you could say, well, I made this tool and this works just as good, and that's fine. So we're gonna talk actually a little bit about Dreamcatcher before we get into the build process. So it is a lightweight memory forensics environment. That's what I pride it on. It's a very slim environment. It doesn't take long to boot up. I'm, I'm good to go in less than 10 minutes. And like I mentioned, we're running a Yara in there. So it's 3.4 SSD, 2.13, and then volatility 2.6 uh, that are gonna be on there. Also dropped on the environment are custom Yara rules from the Yara rules project. If you guys haven't you know, checked out their GitHub or that project, super awesome, super awesome community. And then obviously custom volatility plugins, because if you're having someone do memory forensics and they're not using custom volatility like plugins, it's there's a little issues there. Because there's some great ones out there. I know a lot of people enjoy Hollow Find as a plugin to uh, find out hollowed out processes. That could save a lot of time than doing it all through volatility through the old school way of using this command output and then using that. Um, and the whole thing is it's quickly deployable, right? I keep on saying less than 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. Well, that's the whole purpose of this thing. I wanted something that was crazy fast. So literally from download and loading of the box, the actual download of the image and then the initialization deployment is less than 10 minutes. And then with addition to that, since it is in the Vagrant framework, you can add your own custom Vagrant files. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the future version info, but let's say, say you want to use this and you have your own automated forensic scripts or things that you run that you've created. Well, what you could do is you could create your own Vagrant file, do like a git clone or whatever you need to do to pull it, and then you could actually have that ready to go on your box on that first boot up too. So, or, or you have it pull it for updates. So then you don't have to worry about, oh, I gotta update my scripts on my Vagrant environment, or I gotta do that. You literally could just add it to the Vagrant file, just the actual system commands, and it's gonna run it on boot for you. So now it's time for the build process. And it can, you know, obviously you, you have an image in your head, and it ends up something like that, right? So there's two main methods, I'll say, for Vagrant box creation. Um, one of them has to do with legitimately creating a virtual machine yourself, whether it's in you know, VMware or VirtualBox, probably VirtualBox if you're using the open, you know, the free version of Vagrant. Um, and you basically have to build it, you do whatever you want. So for my, let's say my situation, I installed Volatility, I installed Yara, I got all the dependencies, I got everything, it's good to go. Um, but then uh, there's actually some kind of changes because the way Vagrant works is there's like an SSH, right? So you're SSHing into that virtual machine. So that's how you work it, and that's why it's so headless. That's why it's like low on the resources, right? Because you're not running the GUI. Um, so with that being said, there are system changes. You have to add it in there with the SSH keys and stuff like that to make it compatible with Vagrant. Or else when you boot that box or someone tries to boot your box, they're not going to have access to it because Vagrant's like, I don't know how to interact with this thing. So I decided not to do that because that sounded like a lot of work. So what I did was I actually used a base box. So uh, there's already pre-made boxes. I mentioned I was using the Ubuntu one before. So what happened was Vagrant came out. A lot of these, uh, especially let's say like Debian, the guys behind Debian and, and Ubuntu, they were like Canonical was like, oh, that's really cool. Let's actually put an official box in their repo so people can build off. So I actually built mine off of Ubuntu 1404.5. Um, and basically what I did was I loaded up the Vagrant box. I did all my configurations and uh, then I packaged it up. So with those being said, I actually lied. There's, there's one more option. It's called Packer. We talked about a little bit, right? HashiCorp does a thing. Packer is going to be the way to go because Packer actually allows you to take any virtual machine and generate any virtual image with it, really. So you don't have to just generate a virtual box. You can, or a, a Vagrant box. You can actually, you know, generate an OVF file or you can literally take that box and 
transform into any other image, virtual image, to work with any other platform. So that's why I say it's better, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future version info, especially what you guys are gonna see where I'm, the direction I'm going with this project. It'll make a little bit more sense, and honestly, I kinda really wish I would've done it from the beginning. And then another thing you're gonna do is you gotta make it as small as possible, right? So these users are gonna be downloading and pulling them, and especially for my purpose, I wanted to be very lightweight and slim, so you know, you gotta clean out the garbage, clean out your history, we'll, we'll go with that a little bit more in depth, but that kind of stuff. And then obviously grab that public key from Vagrant, because if you don't, like I said, people are gonna boot up your box and they're not gonna allow it because they don't have the key that was generated. So what happens is, and we'll see it a little bit in the demo, when you load a new Vagrant box, it actually detects the insecure public key and it swaps it out with a generated private key for you on the initial boot. So just make sure you always swap it out. So we're gonna go into a little bit um, of the actual process and show you how easy it is once you do configure it. So this is me at 4 a.m. the night, first night before I presented this project realizing that I didn't save backups. And I was under the gun, it broke, and it was a lot of tears, so just do yourself a favor and just do a quick snapshot, right? So it's as simple as in Vagrant, uh, I'm not sure how well you guys can see that, but it's literally Vagrant, snapshot, save, and then whatever it is. And then I would always highly suggest you list out your snapshots just to make sure it's there before you do it. So let's just throw that there. Once you got everything nice and you're ready to pack it, do a backup of the machine. So if things go wrong in the packing process, you can just revert back to that real quick instead of rebuilding everything. Now we have to do the keys, right? So we talked about swapping out the keys, so you're gonna go into your authorized keys file, and then you're gonna just plop that Vagrant pub key in there, good to go, make sure uh, it's good. Now I will say for those of you who may be doing this on Windows, there's a little trick at this point. You actually can't shut down the VM through the Vagrant console if you're gonna generate a box because it's actually gonna completely Re, it's gonna detect the key again and insert you, it's gonna generate a private one. So what you have to do if you're generating on Windows, you actually have to go into the VirtualBox GUI uh, and power it down from there. Um, and then you can go ahead and finish the process. And I think that might have been fixed in the latest version of Vagrant, but I'm just saying as of the last version, it was still an issue. So we talked about cleaning it up, right? We gotta make sure it's slim, get everything out of the way. So. Honestly, you don't have to get too crazy. I didn't do a lot on there other than just configuration, so just clean your app kit. Um, you know, if you're on Ubuntu, you can zero out the drive just to make it super slim, and then obviously just clean up your history. So this is the point, you, you know, you spend all night and you spend all day and you're just hoping to God this thing works, right? So it's literally as simple as Vagrant package, uh, and then you make the output. So I just called it DC2 because it was the version two at the time. Um, and then if everything goes right, you'll just get a similar prompt where it's just gonna say, clear any, you know, set forwarded ports, exporting it, compressing, okay, return good. Any questions so far? Cool. So we're gonna walk through the demo. Um, I didn't wanna challenge the demo gods, so I actually did a video for the initialization. I know it's gonna be kinda hard to see, so I'm gonna pop that over. I couldn't, I couldn't get it to mirror, so. It'll be interesting once we actually do like the hands-on part we're gonna be working with it, because I'm gonna be doing this all day, because for some reason my mirroring is not working. Oh, I can't see it, I got a better idea. Pull it back and play it, and then I'll pop it over. Okay, so I'm just gonna step out as this is going. Um, what you're seeing here is I basically replicated if you're gonna do this for your IR team, I wouldn't recommend putting your image up in the public cloud, right, because then people are kinda of know what you guys are doing. So what you could do, and what I envision, is having like a, you know, we at my shop, we have an IR server, right, we, we pull things from, so what I'm replicating here is in a virtual environment is like, okay, we're just gonna say, hey, Vagrant Box add, and then you gotta give it the name, so we said Demo Dreamcatcher, then if you do it this way, you actually have to give it either a local file path afterwards, or you have to give it the URL. So basically I'm calling on what I would say is the IR server, right, so we're on, we're on vacation, priority one event came in, someone clicked an email, there's malware, there's O days, okay, cool. So I'm gonna pull it from my uh, IR server, and you'll see it takes a little bit, you know, not too long, and granted it is on an like, internal VM network, so it's a little bit faster than it normally is, but I, I assure you I've pulled my box down from the public repo many times, and uh, there hasn't been an issue. Usually I think the longest it took on a 10 meg connection was about, I think, five minutes for the download, so. 
Let's finishing up. So we're at 100% downloaded. So we actually have the image pulled, right? So we have it. We're on a step. So now we have to initialize it. So the big thing with Vagrant, there's three steps, right? We talked deploy or download, initialize, deploy. So now we're going to do initialization for it. But right here, I'm just making the directory for it. So I go in there and I say Vagrant, initialize, and then demo Dreamcatcher. So what that's doing is like it's getting the box ready. It's getting the Vagrant file in there for you. It's doing right. So if you're on Windows, obviously SSH is not baked into Windows, so you're going to need some sort of client. I'm a fan of Mobile Xterm. You can use whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just setting up the session while this is running. Uh, so actually, that last part, what I missed was I actually did the Vagrant Up. So Vagrant Up is actually how you start the box after you've initialized it. So it takes a little bit of time. Sometimes in the first boot, I said, like, it's going to detect that public key. You're going to say, hey, this is bad, so I've got to swap that out. Um, so it takes a little bit of time while it's getting everything ready, because if you're thinking about it, this is your virtual machine literally being brought up for the first time. It's actually going uh, to update it to the current version. It's going to do an app get up get update and everything for you. So what I'm just doing here is I'm just getting ready. I created my session, so it's on the local host. You know, Vagrant, by default, all Vagrant boxes are Vagrant, uh, port 2222, and then uh, passwords Vagrant. So you got to make sure you have that all set up, and then I'm just waiting for the private key to finish generating, which you'll see. Um, will happen here soon. It's going to say, all right, so I will point this out. If you guys see that warning, don't worry about it too much. It's basically saying a remote connection, or remote connection disconnect retrying. I don't know why, but I've had that pop up with Vagrant sometimes, but it's not because of an actual connection issue. So if you see that keep on returning, then you might have an issue. But if you just see it once, don't freak out. So this is where it's going to detect that public key, right? So now we'll see here shortly the private key, boom, it just popped in. So we got to make sure we add that to our session. And then once we add that to our session, we're good to go and we're good to rock. So you're going to see me, I'm basically going to add that and I'm going to say OK and then I'm just going to start it up. And just like that, we're ready to go. So let's just say we had a priority one event. I think if I remember from the other videos, oh, I can't see the timer on there. I'm not going to see on there because that mirrored. I think this is just around, that was about six minutes. So we went from nothing to a fully configured memory forensics environment in six minutes. Obviously, it's you know, based on your connection, where you're at. I'm not saying it's going to be always six minutes, um, but I don't see it ever taking longer than 15. And then here, what I'm just doing, and we'll, we'll go through a little bit, or maybe I'll just let this run. Um, because of the issue with the mirroring, but um, I'm just showing you the plugins in there. I'm just showing you that everything's installed. We're doing version checks first. So like what version of YAR, which version of SSD, we'll do it for, uh, and then I list the plugins, and you can see there's some good ones in there. Find Evil is one of my favorite. Car packets is cool if there wasn't like disconnection or it was power on off 50 million times. Um, Hollow finds a good one. I haven't really played around the RDP keys, but I just threw it in there because I thought it was a neat idea. Plus it won like, it was a contender in the contest or the volatility plugin contest. And then we list out the YAR rules. And I'm just highlighting things like, hey, yep, this is here. You know, everything's ready for you. Any questions so far? Cool. Pull this back over. All right, so basically for this part, it's going to be kind of janky, right? Because I don't have mirroring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up a, a My Dream Catcher, and we're just going to kind of walk through this priority one event we just got, right? This O day. So I'm going to kind of show you how we can work with it. So those of you that maybe aren't familiar with memory forensics, or those, um, this is not going to be too in-depth. It's going to be a general overview. You might learn a couple tips. Those of you who are very familiar with memory forensics, we all know this is not how an investigation usually ends up, how easy it is. So just pull it up. So what I just did was a process listing of this memory file from this computer. Oh, this is such a pain. And we're going to see some things, right? So we can start seeing from this one, did it pop up where I wanted it to? No, it didn't. I got to scroll down a little bit. That's towards the wrong way. Cool. So because everyone should be able to see that pretty good, right? I made sure they're pretty good. All right. Um, from here, I can already see a couple things. Can anyone, maybe those of you who are right here can see better. What do we notice? Ignore the little memory mishap at the end there. <laughs> that's not malware. That's just the my tool hiccuping. So not Dreamcatcher, right? Not my tool. But 
the tool I use for the capture. So I'll, I'll point it out here. So we all know PC Optimizer, right? PC Optimizer, that's the first thing I see. Um, we look down a little bit more, or actually, no, it's up. And that's why no one's seen it. But if we go up, we'll see another thing for weather bug. Oh, all right. Is this good? Can I live here? OK. So we see weather bug, right? So OK, so we already identified two processes that we pretty much know are not legit. And it's not an O day, right? So whew, that priority one's good, but we obviously have some pups. So from there, you could, what I would do, and I, I was going to bounce this back and forth, but I'm not because this is going to get crazy. Um, from here, you would do like a net scan, right? We can see what kind of outbound connections is trying to establish stuff like that. Um, I will actually bring it back because I got to show you guys the user history, the web history. Let's see, there we go. So that's like part of my investigations, right? Now, it's not over once we identify the malware or whatever, because a big part of it too is well, how to get on the machine. Was it an attachment? Was it a user error? Was it, is it spreading through you know, network protocols? Is it a worm? Like, what, what's behind here? So, what we're going to do. And those of you that um, aren't maybe familiar with it, I, I used the Windows Live Response tool by Brymore Labs uh, for the capture. If you guys aren't familiar with it, it's super awesome. Gives you a ton of good triage info. Uh, it'll dump route registry stuff for you, and it'll do um, memory dumps and disk images. So let's say if you're from a shop that maybe you're not the one going out all the time doing the actual capture. So like I work for a big company. I'm not going to fly to Jacksonville every time to do a memory dump. But what's cool is I can give these local teams um, like a tool like this. And if I ever need to ping them back, say, hey, can you just pull the triage info from me? It's that first option. They're familiar with it. So when I ping them again, like, hey, actually, I need a memory dump from that. They're already in this tool. And they know they can do the memory dump. And then they can also do a disk image if you need to as well. I'm just going to get to this directory. The reason why I mentioned that is because we're going to actually see some of the live response data, so the history they carved for the uh, capture process. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm just calling strings on a dat file. Um, if you aren't familiar with strings, if you have some like kind of something like a dat file, obviously if you ever catted a dat file, it's going to throw you a bunch of nonsense. So if you strings it though, if you string it though, and then you grep it a certain way. So what I basically did is I string the file, and then I'm going to grep search because I want to see what the user was searching. Blah blah blah. And plus I made it, and I know how it happened. So I'm going to bring this up to the good part. So we already identified the malware. We know it's bad. What was that? Wonderful. Gotta love it. All right, cool. This will work now. So we can see some searches. So basically, it's going to show us, oh, well, we see Bing. That's the first problem, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but we see things like Leet Hacks they're searching for, or Free Music Downloader. We see more Leet Hacks again. Uh, we see free movies online. Uh, we can see Weatherbug. There's Weatherbug. Um, we see Free Game Downloader. We see a bunch of stuff, right? We don't see a good browsing habit. So from this standpoint, our priority one, we won it by we found the malicious uh, executable at that point when we found it. I'm not like I said, I didn't go as in depth because of this mirroring issue I'm having. But at that point, that stuff and then, uh, all right, cool. I kind of cut out there for a second. Um, but you could do some net stuff and then you would carve it, right? If you really weren't sure if it was really something that you could carve it. And then at this point, this would just to kind of wrap up your report to be like, oh, how did it happen? And we can say here, well, the user was elite hacks or stuff like that. So obviously, user error, layer eight is always going to be the killer, right? So 
probably went to a website, either got hit with a malvertising campaign, or they just legitimately downloaded free game downloader, or as we can see, they downloaded Weatherbug and uh, it created issues. So lessons learned in future version info. Lessons learned, I'm not gonna kill, or we'll talk about the packer. So the reason why, and this will make sense in a couple of should have been used, I should have used it. Um, that should have definitely been a thing. Um, snapshots, I'm not kidding, like, the backups would have saved me so much time. When I'm saying I've literally recreated this box probably up to 20 times from scratch, I literally did that 20 times. Um, I mean, I guess it wasn't so bad because I had my auto install script, but still, like, you don't want to do something 20 times because you're just negligent and didn't do a backup, or you backed it up and then reformatted your system every other week, and then you don't have it because you didn't grab that backup. So do, make sure you do the snapshots. It's simple, but just do it. Vagrant, conf uh, the Vagrant file configuration is going to be needed. I was hoping to get it, like I said, in this latest version. It will be in the next version. Um, so the reason why I say that is because I am a terminal guy. I don't like to leave my terminal. I hate using, you know, having to go to the GUI and do this. So with that being said, with this box, because it's so light, you know, this, the specs on it aren't great out of the box. You have to change them. So what a Vagrant file can do is you can give those hardware changes. Say, hey, man, I need more for than 5, 12 megs for, you know, RAM, for instance. Because obviously if we're trying to run volatility in an environment, or especially when we get into higher processing for, you know, that 512 megs of RAM is not going to cut it, neither is that single core. So you, that would be somewhere where you could, you know, up the cores and you could up the RAM. And um, that's needed, right, because this is a forensics environment. So that's something I should have included in the beginning, but it will be in there. Um, so the plan for this, yeah, I thought this was going to be like this Vagrant box that I was just going to do all these wonderful forensic things with. I was going to throw some network forensics tools. I was going to throw disk forensics tools. I was going to throw malware detonation and analysis tools in there. Uh, so if you want to spin up like your own little isolated uh, malware lab to detonate things quickly, um, you know, I was in things like Wireshark and SleuthKit. But the problem is the whole point of Dreamcatcher is a lightweight memories forensics environment. And if I did that, it would be no better than me earlier calling out the bloaties tools, right? So with that being said, and this is why Packer comes back into it, I am planning on pushing a project called Nest. And for now, it's just going to be a virtual image that you can put into whatever you want. If you want to do a Vagrant box, if you want to do it in virtual box, if you want to do VMware. But the main thing is it's going to have Cuckoo, so that's why you get, you know, Nest. I'm so creative sometimes. But it's literally, I have to do it that way, and I wish I would have, because now I'm literally going to have to build a VM again. I'm going to have to build it all over from scratch when I do this next version. So if I would have done Packer originally, I wouldn't, have any, I, I wouldn't have to do that. So that will be the future of Dreamcatcher. Um, for now, I'm just, I decided I'm going to keep it a lightweight memory forensic environment. And as Yara updates and volatility updates, I'll push those updates to it, make sure it's always current. Um, and as long as any new plugins or tools or Yara rules or things like that, um, I'll throw in there. I will say, because I didn't highlight it because of the mirroring issue, but I did throw Vol Utility on there. I didn't configure it for you, so I know a lot of people like Vol Utility. They like the dashboard interface, so that is actually on there. You just have to configure it yourself. And I also did throw Vol Diff on there. So if you like Vol Diff or if you're not familiar with Vol Diff, you can look into it. It's a really good way of taking a baseline memory image with a, you know, uh, suspicious one. And you can, if as long as it's the same environment, it's going to give you a lot of analysis quickly uh, for it. Oh, uh, yeah, but that's pretty much it. I know I finished a little early because of the mirroring. I didn't want to keep on bouncing back and forth and closing windows, but if you guys have any questions or answers, I'd love to answer them for you. So that's the thing, right? Like, I'm learning as we go, and that's why I love that suggestion, is things like this is like, I didn't think of everything when I built it. So, um, well, the things with the Base64, though, I mean, it is a Linux environment, so you can do, like, the basic one, um, stuff like that. So it is a Unix environment, but I'll, I'll piggyback off that, right? So in the next version, I actually will include other sort of tools that maybe aren't in the realm of memory forensics. So that capture tool I use for everything for the demo, um, I'm actually going to drop that in there. So that way you don't even have to leave it if you need a capture tool. So you literally spin this thing up, you have your capture tool, and you have your stuff to go through the capture with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's actually the, the I'm definitely gonna probably take your input for those two ones and try to integrate that in the future. Anything else? Cool. Like I said, guys, I appreciate it. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, and thank you for coming. I know it's four. Um, my main thing, like I said, you can use Dreamcatcher. I would love you to, um, but I really would just like to get you guys playing around in Vagrant, see what you can do. I'm sure we're all in different niches here. We might have different roles in our security organization. So why don't you just see what you have and see if you can automate or make it easier for yourself. Uh, that's the biggest thing. So if you do want to, you can feel free to take a screenshot. I know this is terrible. Like I said, if you want to find out about the wild adventure of last night, that's why this slide looks like that, because I didn't, couldn't fix it before we got up here in time. So, um, but if you want, you know, I can send it even to you. You can always feel free to hit me up on Twitter um, or email me, and I'm, I'm always willing to work, so I can give you those resources. Thank you.